Welcome back to World War Now, everybody. I am your host, Conrad Franz, joined as always by Dmitry Kaligan. This is our third episode in the month of February 2023. We're getting close to that one-year anniversary of Russia's special military operation in Ukraine. We've got a lot of things to talk about this week, from stuff going on in the sky, UFOs, towards big shuffles in Russia going on in the military operation, to Israel, Iran, all sorts of things. So, uh, Dmitry, how are you? Doing great, Conrad. Glad to be here. And of course, it's almost our fifth month complete of World War Now. And, you know, things are really, you know, of course, picking up pace. And there's always interesting news to speak about. And we have some great takes for you today. And of course, some of the great big news events that have occurred recently. Of course, we'll be covering most of them today. So, yeah, it's it's been a pretty good week overall, but I'm looking forward to what's happening next. And, you know, the psyops abound, big uh, kind of, you know, esoteric things are in the news that, you know, sometimes only live in niche orthodox circles. But yeah, technically this is the 20th episode of World War Now, if you count my solo 10.5 episode as one. So, you know, we're, we've, we've come a long way. Thanks, everybody that's supported us this far. But we all know what you're really here for, and that is us talking about UFOs and psyops and... Uh, what's going on in the sky of course america has been plagued with um apparently compromised airspace we're shooting down things over canada lake huron off the coast of south carolina of course with that first silly balloon thing and beyond that there's now uh all sorts of renewed talk. I remember people from it forget we saw this in 2021. Tucker Carlson had people on to talk about it from the intelligence community. It was a bunch of actually things were released in 2021, a bunch of classified documents supposedly about UFOs, some images actually that you've probably seen before of some, you know, flight radar, like infrared plane cameras showing unidentified aerial vehicles or flying objects. And again, remember, UFO, people always immediately start thinking flying saucers. A UFO it's just an unidentified flying object. It could even be used to indicate something that is most likely considered military. And as we said on the show with Jay, as the news broke when we were recording the show, I made the apt and I still believe correct observation that the balloons were a big nothing just being hyped up to foment war with China, which I, uh, I stand by. And I think that's really all the analysis that's needed of those supposed balloons. Although I am reading that apparently it's some balloon hobby group believes that one of their balloons was shot down with a $400,000 missile, and, they, and their balloons, I believe, cost $15. So if that's true, that is, um, that's hilarious. If not, I mean, it, uh, and it would also be a big propaganda victory for China and Russia, because that's just, uh, that's very silly. But again, with the UFO dialogue, many people say, oh, this is a big distraction, and in many ways it is, but remember, the UFO idea, of course, and the idea of aliens reinforces scientism and so many other things that we're kind of against on this uh, on this very mystical pilled show. But I think, in general, you need to remember that there is, as as global government rises and the uh, and perhaps what you could call the resistance to global government rises, the forces that want that unified global government are going to work harder on their psychological operations, and part of that is, you know space salvation and, and, and space brothers and, you know, entities from this cosmos and all this kind of thing. Because if you think about globalism as an idea, nationalism, you know, nation states began to unify and exist as collectives against, you know, their enemies and collective enemies from outside as tribes would rally under one banner to fight as a nation. And now to create a global identity, they want to create ideas of us versus perhaps another species from a different planet. So then the primary identity of humanity would become global, you know, earth, whatever, as opposed to being Russian, American, or especially Christian, Muslim, whatever, like, you know, the, whatever the true religious dogmas that we hold by are, that's a division that they ultimately would seek to break down. Yeah, that's right. So a common sort of humanity, as we see in the science fiction films, of course, united against an alien enemy. And of course, you know, you, you see this in even uh, book genres and video games, for example, like Warhammer 40,000 or even, you know, certain other sci-fi fiction like Dune or, you know, uh, you, you name it, right? Star Wars even. So it's it's been around Hollywood for a long time. And notice that even Father Seraphim Rose mentions that most of these UFO genres, these narratives have appeared after World War II. So in terms after a gigantic war, when the world went into this Cold War period of nations changing, of course, psyops occurring everywhere from both the Soviet Union as well as the US government. And then you had this sort of a black swan event where you had these unidentified flying objects appearing all over the United States, allegedly people, you know, experiencing weird events. Of course, the rise of New Age religions, various cults, 
you know, of course, the 1960s, 70s, overall an abandonment of Christianity and Christian values coinciding with these uh, people seeing visions and aliens. Of course, this uh, can all be thrown away as superstition, as just American nothing burger, you know, people just inventing silly little things, right? But it, I think it is, there is a certain relationship between all of these sightings and all these phenomenon, of course. And big shout out, of course, to the people probably getting the most coverage from these events. For example, you know, Bob Lazar, who appeared on uh, the Joe Rogan podcast, and of course, Joe Rogan's loving all this narrative and stuff, and, uh, you know, Coast to Coast AM, the uh, radio talk about, you know, aliens and conspiracies from Las Vegas, and George Knapp, the main podcaster there, they're probably really loving it. And, you know, Jay Dyer and Alex Jones as well, of course, greatly focusing, especially on a lot of these psyops and a lot of these phenomena occurring around the United States. They're, of course, covering it in much more detail than, say, even our segment today. So definitely go check those things out and, you know, not going to endorse any particular other podcast, you know, just because we don't necessarily share all of their views. But um, it is necess it is definitely a subject which at the moment is at the forefront, at least in American domestic news. You'll notice, you know, openly politicians are speaking about it the president of the united states joe biden is openly you know giving speeches mentioning aliens like we've kind of transitioned into this it's come out to the forefront now we've transitioned into this uh new phase of hey it's a possibility that there are these objects from you know somewhere and we do have to unite as a country or even maybe as a world maybe it's a as you mentioned conrad maybe it is a globalist united nations agenda behind all of this that hey the world needs to unite in order to not just prevent climate change and address you know social inequality and communism and all this other stuff but as well to fight to unite against the common threat i have a uh old twitter thread of course that account has long been banned but it was a it's been archived on a friend of mine's blog i'm going to have that linked in the description here on substack and youtube but it goes through a lot of what father seraphim rose writes in his fantastic book that I recommend everybody read, Orthodoxy and the Religion in the Future, which I believe gives the seminal take on the UFO phenomenon and aerial entities and, and whatnot from a, from a saintly perspective in Orthodoxy. It's a, something that I read on my journey to Orthodoxy that really actually changed my life, so I encourage everyone to get that book. But in that, of course, Father Seraphim talks about the similarities between demonic appearances and even certain possession experiences and a lot of the actual psychological ufo phenomenon he of course also identifies sightings you know being a, like daylight discs radar visuals and everything which was in 2021 that was also like the extent of what people were talking about with ufos but now we've apparently shot things down and have all sorts of other secret things that the government has admitted to on that that have now come to the forefront as dimitri said we've gone from you know, maybe this is a thing and the government kind of hints at it being a theoretical possibility to now, no, this is actually like a likely possibility and we're, you know, just as interested in it as the public, which is an interesting kind of sea change. But I encourage everybody, remember, I want to read the quote exactly, but it was uh, St. Gabriel Ergabadzi. St. Gabriel says, during the Antichrist times, the strongest temptation will be anticipation of salvation from the cosmos, from humanoids, extraterrestrials that are actually the demons. One should rarely look up at the skies. The signs might be deceptive. Thus, one may be ruined. And I'm not saying that we are in the Antichrist times right now, but again, we are in typological times, times that will, a pattern that will ultimately be repeated in a greater degree, perhaps in the future. And just as those at the end times perhaps fall for the greatest of deceptions, those now that fall for deceptions on this earth in this time, you know, may find themselves unfortunately in a wrong state of mind when they when they when they pass from this mortal coil to the next because of something that they foolishly believe that led them away from the gospel. And I think as of course there is scientism as well as the rise of kind of new age religion. I was talking to Dimitri about this before we started recording. Just imagine a possibility where we talked about you know, perhaps uniting against an alien enemy, but imagine perhaps an alien kind of savior race coming to us, but perhaps we're pushed, at least as the media would sell it to us, to the brink of a quote-unquote nuclear war. Imagine, you know, the powers that be have our, have an ascendant kind of race of alien masters come and be like, no, you must put aside your nukes. I mean, isn't this from, this is like a direct quote plot from a movie. I can't remember which exact movie, which sci-fi movie it is, but they've seeded this idea before. And, you know, perhaps we need to come together as a human race, put aside our weapons and submit to, you know, some space federation or whatever and live in progressive Zog world that they have in Star Trek for us, you know, where we're all working in the diverse cabin with our uh, with our mutated space brothers, except none of those alien races actually exist. It would just be like transmogrified humans and robots, you know, us living in, in, in perfect diversity, you know, Captain Kirk style. But 
I think that's something that people need to really keep in mind as this has become one of the main things that people in the media are talking about. Like, I think UFOs and air stuff and balloons have been trending almost every day on Twitter since this has happened. So stay wary. Yeah, and I just wanted to read a quote out of um, Saint Seraphim Rose's book, um, of course, on on aliens, which, and Saint Seraphim, mind you, because he lived in a period when Hollywood cinema was just kind of rising and coming to the forefront, he does, of course, comment on the film that came out during his life, which was Close Encounters of the Third Kind, right? The movie about aliens invading, and he says, the new film Close Encounters of the Third Kind is a shocking revelation of how superstitious post-Christian man has become ready in an instant and unquestioningly to believe and follow hardly dis hardly disguised demons wherever they may lead. So he's essentially commenting that, look, all the demons need to do is take on a guise which is interesting and, of course, alluring to Christians and, you know, obviously the Christian man seeking, or the, the post-Christian man, so to speak, and even, of course, lukewarm Christians well, seeking miracles and finding a regular, proper, sacramental, pious Christianity, boring ones, will, of course, follow these follow these people where they may lead and you know we see we see people of course apostatizing from christianity all over the place for you know even political movements like we see in the um in the ukraine for example is a good example of uh, you know people apostatizing from orthodoxy why because of a, a war a conflict a thing which you know may last a year may last two years but essentially is a drop in the ocean of eternity so it's a horrible thing which is happening now and they are leaving their own faith, they're leaving their eternal souls, their salvation, because they're upset at what's happening in this mortal world. And of course, this is why the devil uses these various tools of and people's emotions to drag them away from Christ and aliens and this belief in something greater, something more, you know, and of course, belief in miracles and belief in superstitious beings, which may, may somehow bring humanity to enlightenment. This is all very Masonic, very occult. It, it is in some ways, and I, I know this word is, word is overused, but it is very Alistair Crowley and satanic, right? This understanding that we can actually summon these beings, we can speak to them, communicate with them. Of course, folks like Alex Jones and Jay Dyer go into this in a lot more depth. They do speak about how elites and people in these uh, high echelons of society, you know, they do seek certain enlightenments from other, so let's just say, extra mortal sources which aren't Christian. So there is that understanding as well. And this is something that goes back to the ancient world. Of course, pagan religions of various sorts have also consulted beings from outer space so to speak beings from other dimensions and you yeah, know this has been going on for a long time so the fact that i guess modern secular americans are finally awakening to say forces which aren't christian and forces which aren't material is on one hand not surprising on the other hand kind of uh part from cause so it is uh not unexpected that's what i would say and of course it's very horrifying seeing that like you know your neighbors and people watching the news and are actually excited hey there's aliens this is really good this is something interesting is happening no this is probably not a good thing on one hand, if it's a PSYOP, yes, that's horrible that the government is trying to fool us. On the other hand, if there are really these demonic sightings going on, then that's obviously a negative as well for society. It really shows how far things have fallen. Well, don't you think, Conrad? Like, either way, whatever the case, it's probably a, an overall a negative for, you know, the regular American Christian. Well, I totally agree. And of course, there's, a, there's no telling at our level, we're just citizens, of the difference between where the line between secret military aircraft, demonic entity, or collaborationist interdimensional entity with the elite, where that begins and ends. But I just want to make something clear that for people who think this is all just silly nonsense talk, that uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, the former head of the European Union, in 2016, he addressed the EU and explicitly claimed to be in contact with aliens. This, this video still exists out there. I'm sure you can find it on BitChute. Maybe we'll have it linked below. It's been scrubbed from YouTube. By, it used to be on official, like, EU sources because it was just part of his, you know, he's an important guy. What he says gets recorded if it's in front of the council. But he said that, of course, and this, and this shows that the elites, at the very least, believe in this space mythology, believe in this kind of exotheology. And in many ways, I can't remember who said it. It was some famous... So someone famous in the elite basically said that you know the whole alien life thing would be the death knell of christianity like it would be it would raise mass skepticism and everything and just think about how many people you know in your life that justify their unbelief or their sin by just saying oh i believe in science or whatever it is you know they they have their kind of petty little intellectual half-baked reason of why they don't believe and that's they run with that forever right i mean this the world that we live in now wants to give everybody those little reasons so that it just seems easier to check out and do what you want to do in life and follow your passions. But when it comes to like 
again, this just being a psyop and an idea and something that they're going to project into the sky and use fake military craft or actual demonic entities appearing. I don't think there's a dialectic between those two things. I think it can easily be both. And that, I mean, even just in the, uh, what is it, in the Arthur C. Clarke novel Childhood's End, which was made into like a miniseries, at the end of it, you know, the aliens reveal themselves with like humanity's children and the alien, like the head of the aliens is literally just a like cloven hoofed, pitchfork tail horned demon and he makes it pretty clear like the the analogy is very clear like it's kind of the prometheus myth retold you know the aliens coming and bringing kind of what, what seems to be like secular globalism scientism to the world and then you know enlightening us as like godlike figures just as prometheus as in a luciferian way brought you know fire down from from heaven and enlightened man with it and allowed him to fight the gods or whatever. So the, the symbolism goes very deep. We encourage you obviously to read Father Sarah from listen to the sources we talked about. I'll have my thread about this linked below. But the saints have written about this even in, I believe it was the ninth century, you know, there's crazy people at the time talking about like ships, like masted sea ships coming down from the sky and abducting people, which of course we know this is demonic, this is delusion, and it shows that at whatever technological era you appear in, the demons will seek to exploit that, at, you know, at that cutting edge and at that visual level and in, your, in the imagination of your mind of the zeitgeist you live in to figure out how exactly to deceive you. Because, spoiler alert, they're smarter than you and have a lot longer of a time to consider how to get you to send yourself to hell. Yeah, that's right. And it's just as Conrad said, how it could be both both a psyop and demonic, of course, activity in nature. We, have, we do have to remove the spiritual realm, especially that of the demons. They do tie themselves and impact of course locations around the world which is why we see you know um that famous ranch in america which was you know allegedly haunted by alien activity of course there is all these places around the world which are allegedly you know haunted by certain events and people see ufos there and there are these uh supernatural superstitious activities um of course occurring there and you may think well this is of course garbage but you may just remember during the Russian Empire there was this great meteorite or at least you know what's said to be a meteorite explosion asteroid event, the Tunguska, the Tung Tunguska incident, which occurred in 1908. So this is, um, of course, towards the end of the Russian Empire. But, you know, we had great people like St. John of Kronstadt was actually still alive in that time. Uh, and this, of course, occurred in far Siberia in in uh, you know, on June the 30th, 1908. And just to show you, you can find photographs online of, of the Tunguska event, but uh, no one really saw it occur. It kind of just happened and it left a gigantic crater in the ground, destroying, of course, thousands, if not millions of trees. And the explosion size was roughly, they say, about, about 12 megatons, which is equivalent to the Moab, which Donald Trump dropped on Syria in 2017 um, on the ISIS base. And of course, that's probably about equivalent to a nuclear explosion so it could destroy an entire city so we do have these super supernatural events of course occurring in various places around the world and also there's also comments from old athenite monks of course that mount Athos back in the day was a place where pagans used to sacrifice people to demons which is why on mount Athos you can find old uh especially in the woods you can find old sacrificial stones and places where people would drain human blood and you know perform human sacrifices which is why mount Athos for a lot of the Orthodox Christian monks going there, it is a battlefield. It's not just a, you know, a nice retreat. Mount Athos is very heavily, especially the outskirts outside of the monasteries where the ascetics live. It is a place which is inhabited by many, many evil spiritual entities which tie themselves to the nature, to the places where these dark rituals took place a long time ago. I know this sounds like fantasy to some people, but this is a proper Orthodox um orthodox theology straight out of the lives of saints and of course this is what um, you know you see this in the life of saint john the evangelist on patmos when he exercises the demon out of the sauna and you know demons and these dark entities do tie themselves to both aerial as well as on the ground uh you know geo geo locations in, in a way so could we consider that in certain places you see more aliens than others? Like, for example, the United States. Notice how the sightings of UFOs in the US are a lot more common than, say, in Russia or China. Or You, see, you simply don't see the amount of reports. And, you know, that's possibly based on the spiritual state of certain areas of America. And, you know, that's, <clears throat> of course, that could be coinciding with the government experiments going on there as well as other psyops. But all these things, of course, as Conrad said, could be part and parcel all of you know all happening at the same time so it's not to be dismissed it's something to be looked at we of course won't go too much in depth into it on future podcasts but at the moment it is 
a subject which is on the headlines of news, so it does need to be addressed from, I suppose, a Christian, as well as a geopolitical perspective, because it is taking the American attention away from, say, other events going on in Europe, in Ukraine, uh, in the Middle East, and such other matters. Well, before we get into some other stuff in America, I just wanted to briefly, on this last thing on this, is that, as, as you mentioned so much about the aerial realm and everything, and you mentioned the Tunguska explosion, like 1908, that's 10 years almost exactly before the assassination of the Tsar and his family, right? And that, we believe, kind of was a big ushering in of a new event, what St. Gabriel, and then a few decades later, the times that St. Gabriel himself might have been describing, when it's becoming so dangerous to even look up at the skies at all because of the amount of deceptions that you'd be experiencing. And before, I mean, like, for those holy people and those pious traditional people, they probably, many people probably took that event and some other kind of, there have been, Russia is a large landmass. It has a lot of comets and meteors because it has such a large portion of the sky spread out above it, of course. We remember, many remember the 2013 Chelyabinsk meteorite, which injured like a thousand people. Thankfully, no one died, but it was just such a huge explosion in the sky. These sort of things do have meaning to people. I mean, think about how perhaps, you know, you read the Iliad, the Odyssey, how would Achilles, you know, interpret something like this? That's not to say that we're pagan, but just as a, if, if you understand that something's going to happen, to take these sort of things, much like prophecies, and understand that nature also communicates with us, then we take that as a sign of repentance and prayer, not to take it too far and get weird into astrology, as in many ways it seems that the powers that be want us to do and spend our time looking to the sky for salvation. Instead, you know, we can take that understand what it means and pray to God about these about these events that we know are kind of coming back to the fore a hundred years later of those fantastic and horrible things that happened at the beginning of the 20th century. But with all that, I guess we need to get into some of the things going on in the States. Of course, there's been dozens of train derailments in the news. We have some people claiming this is just alt media blowing things out of proportion there's actually 1700 train derailments a year others are saying this is you know a coordinated psyop attack by the u.s on the american people you know opinions are flying around everywhere uh dimitri i'm wondering if you have any thoughts on the general situation going on and what you think the uh what, what you think this means about american power in general well, I think it's one of the symptoms of, you know, just the American infrastructure suffering under the weight of the policies which have been, you know, kind of affecting the, you know, the things such as diversity hires, like affirmative action, all these policies which are destroying, of course, the American people, destroying mor morale as well. Notice it's a, I think it's m also a cultural thing, just the fact that infrastructure itself is suffering under the weight of this great capitalist empire, which is very successful and rich, but also internally morally corrupt and i think that's you know uh, the evidence of that is obviously the american elections which have shown that joe biden can actually defeat trump and you have you know democrats you know obviously if the election was unfair and it was stolen as some claim then you know that's that makes sense but also just a large pop pop portion of the population of course voting for the democrats and you know uh, of course protesting roe v wade being overturned you have all these negative events occurring and now now you're seeing this on the infrastructural and you just have you know, riot, riots as well. We saw, you know, just the, the fact that people can burn down entire suburbs and the police not reacting to it. And now we're seeing, of course, the trains and the transportation systems. And of course, with just the infrastructure, which is, you know, required for, you know, people's livelihoods essentially being affected by these, uh, n you know, by essentially mismanagement on, on a large, you know, sort of large scale area. And, you know, the, the outcomes, of course, are long term pollution, which, again, isn't being addressed. It's not like, well, the train was derailed and now we can go back to, you know, now we can fix it up. And, you know, there was a mistake and we're not going to repeat it. And, you know, it was just a one off. But no, it was. Uh, you know, the train wreck occurred, the pollution continues, and it still hasn't been addressed. And it's been, you know, what, close to a week now? Like, it, it's almost as if uh, the American, at least the bureaucrats at the top, don't really care about it. And there's no real, uh, I mean, Joe Biden's not even mentioning it. So, uh, where, well, where exactly? The time yeah. of, say, mm -hmm. Maybe by the time of this release, this has changed. But as far as I can tell, it seemed that the feds were actually turning down East Palestine, Ohio, which is one of the big things we're talking about with their vinyl chloride leak and explosion turned down some of their requests for federal aid. And that's, of course, absurd as they've sent hundreds of billions of our tax dollars over to, you know, fight for Zog over in Ukraine and just kill, have, you know, fund a war that's just as it goes on is leading to thousands of just Christian men dying. But and in general, we're seeing we saw other things in Houston, Florida, Tucson, chemicals, not just train derailments or explosions, like full on, like kind of chemical, as well as an increase still in like egg egg factory destruction, other supply critical food supply chain issues being destroyed. So this is again, maybe 
there's a psychological operation that all of this is just being dramatically covered to hype people that are dissidents up into a frenzy, or maybe there really is, you know, agenda the agenda of the globalists that want us to eat bugs, that want us to all live in pods, that want us to not have any land, you know, mm-hmm. as Bill Gates and Bezos buy the land. You know, maybe the theories that come out of that and become almost they, they, you almost don't even have to parse them out. They become so obvious what the kind of agenda is. Maybe that's what's actually going on. And of course, my perspective is that eventually they'll start blaming this on cyber warfare. They'll blame this on China, Russia, Iran, you know, attacking our rail infrastructure. But remember, we I'll go a little E. Michael Jones here. Who's the transportation infrastructure man? You know, who's the head of transportation here in the U.S.? It's Pete Buttigieg. This is a man who thinks who thinks the anus is a sex organ, as um, as E. Michael Jones would say. And so if you think that, as far as inbound and outbound contact goes, you know, how are you really going to make the trains run on time? I think that's a valid question to ask. But in general, you even look at Norfolk Southern, who are the ones that are being blamed for the train derailment in East Palestine. If you looked at their website, you'd think the entire company was run by minorities and women, which I'm sure it's not. I'm sure a lot of most of the people actually putting in the work on the rail in a lot of ways are still, you know, white men. But that's not to say that they aren't going towards that goal that's reflected already in their marketing. So there is always that possibility. This is just fundamental, just American decline from the lack of social cohesion to just the you know, the IQ crisis and just the kind of expertise crisis that's going on as all of our institutions have been slowly filled with fundamentally just mediocre actors. Yeah, and of course, the saddest thing is just the average civilian American affected by these pollution explosions, like this is their backyards, this is their country, this, these are their states, their suburbs, their territories, their national parks, which are affected. And why are tens of billions of taxpayer American dollars, and we can safely say they are taxpayer dollars because the amount of uh, money the um, the tax organization in America is actually taking from the citizens is exorbitant. So these are taxpayer dollars being sent to Ukraine in tens of billions and not actually being invested back into the infrastructure, into you know even pollution control. After the, of course, uh, infrastructure breakdown occurs, there's no one actually cleaning it up. And the, of course, the federal agency is working to sabotage the entire thing. It's just, it, it's apparent. I think it's... Uh, you know, it's it's quite it's quite stark reminder that hey, look, the elites of America actually, the people in charge, do not really care about the actual citizens on the ground. They seem to care more about you know, actually spreading the message. They're all their own Democrat policies, virtue signaling online about you know gender identity, about global warming, about what's happening in Ukraine, unrelated to the actual affairs of the citizens at home, right? Because this this is not this is not patriotic. What's happening here? This is like you know degenerate. Yeah, and as we, you know, blow up the Nord Stream pipelines to inflict a similar crisis on the people of Germany and all sorts of things, which, you know, it just never ends. It's just, it's it's just, we do live in the late stage of the empire, and it's showing that people talk a lot about this, like, the vassalization, like, from the Roman analysis, like, we're seeing, and Dimitri might bring up some of this going on in Russia as well, which we're also going to talk about in a, in a in a premium episode that's coming up as well, but... America is experiencing, and you know, like what you could call the Anglo-Saxon core of America are experiencing kind of the the, the, the vassals of the empire, you know, the, the groups and peoples that have been absorbed into the American identity through the past hundred years of empire have now ascended above, you know, core Americans. And those core Americans are now experiencing the brunt of both a regime that hates them due to terrible rhetoric, as well as just an empire that is that, that is on its last legs and is that's that's kind of why it's because it's ascended the fringes to the center and now the original center has now been relegated to the fringes which that's not something that can be sustained especially in a long-term military conflict with two homogenous nations that ultimately together have much larger population than you which is unfortunately where this whole thing seems to be headed with russia china the u.s and nato Turkey, of course, being where a lot of it gets decided. We're obviously going to be covering those elections as they continue to go on. But with all of that, it's time to move to Russia, Ukraine, to the the hot battle, the war itself, unless Dmitry, of course, has anything else he wants to say in the U.S. But as we move there, I want to hear everything going on with the SMO. There's uh, leadership shakeups, big things going on. We've got a lot to talk about. Dmitry, what is up? Yeah, there's some huge leadership changes in in Russia. Actually, the country as a whole, not just on the on the front of the um, of the special military operation in Ukraine. Now, firstly, if you may recall, in October last year, the uh, the new general commander of all the forces um, actually in the special military operation was announced to be Surovikin, and this was the first time 
you know, I suppose during the special military operation that one person was announced to become, you know, the united leader of this front. Now, Surovikin lasted from October until January of this year and since has been changed and now his new, he, he has become the vice sort of, the vice commander, the second in charge. So the first man in charge at the moment is an army of the, uh, a general of the Russian army named Gerasimov. Now, Valery Gerasimov, of course, is well known in Russia as being one of the more technical, one of the most, one of the more prestigious generals in the Russian army and of course he is probably the second in charge after you could say Shoigu the minister of defense who's in charge of the military um many people of course uh, especially in the West, they really don't like Gerasimov. They say he is the mastermind behind the entire Ukraine invasion, as they call it, to begin with. But Gerasimov is the man at the moment in charge on the ground in Ukraine. Now, the shakeup that has occurred is so just for those interested, Russia is divided, its military administration is divided into five districts. Now there's a southern district which covers the Caucasus, the Northern Caucasus Mountains. These are places like Dagestan, Chechnya, Rostov, Crimea as well is also included here. All the areas around the, um, touching the Caspian and the Black Sea, as well as some of the, the, the lands, including, you know, even up to Volgograd, which used to be Stalingrad, all those areas, that's called the Southern District. And that, there's a new commander actually, who's been announced to lead this particular, um, to lead this particular district. And this is very interesting because this commander, like we actually done background searches on each one of these commanders and they all seem to be somewhat qualified to lead these military districts and administration. Now this commander, Colonel General Sir Sergei Kuzavlyov is, he's a veteran of the first and second Chechen campaigns, which, so he does have credentials. He doesn't go as far as, you know, Afghanistan during the Soviet years, but he has served in the military actively. And he did serve in Syria between November and February, 2021. So he did serve, serve three months in, in, in Syria during the Russian, of course, campaign. And now he's of course le leading that Southern area. And he's in charge essentially of defending Crimea and defending, you know, preventing events. Ultimately, he's he's the main admin behind all the protecting, uh, you know, places like that Kerch Crimean bridge, which was destroyed by Ukrainian terrorists, uh, you know, earlier, earlier last year. So you do recall some, these areas are very vulnerable. So of course, having a new, general in charge of this military district is of course really big news for russia now of course there are other of course generals that were appointed for example lieutenant general eugene nikiforov was appointed the military the western military district commander of the the western district now the western military district is north of the southern district and it touches upon areas adjacent to ukraine belarus it, of course, includes St. Petersburg and Moscow, so both of the Russia's historical capitals, as well as, you know, the city of Vladimir and other areas. So Nikiforov, you know, there's not much known about him. He did serve in Syria for some time, but he doesn't he doesn't have the same weight behind him as Kuzovlyov does. And he was actually involved in Ukraine last year, actively on the ground. He was leading one of the battlefronts, actually, of Russians. I believe that those the Russians who actually attacked from the north from Belarus into Ukraine in March and February 2022. So he actually does have these, I suppose, uh, accolades behind him from a Russian perspective that he actually has served on the ground. And he was appointed like this leader of the Western uh, of the Western Russian military district, which is a huge responsibility. So he has to be responsible for not only Moscow, but Petersburg, cooperation of the Belarus, but Belarusians and all of these other uh, major Russian cities. So, and of course he's a, uh, you can say that he he is probably going to be more involved in Ukraine along with Kuzovlyov, but two other appointments also took place in the last week, and one of them was the, I mean, you could say it's a demotion of the Colonel General Rustam Muradov. Now, Rustam Muradov is an ethnic Dagestani who, of course, served Russia his entire life, born in Russia. He's quite young, 49 years of age, and he was the he was actually the commander of the recent uh, failed attack in Ugladar, which I think we'll speak about in a little bit of the Russian military, you know, the Russian operation in Ugladar actually failed horrendously. And so he was appointed the commander of the Eastern Russian military district, which is, well, as you can see on the map, like Eastern Russia, that's obviously Siberia and the lands adjacent to China, Japan, the Pacific Ocean. Of course, he's in charge also of the Pacific fleet in some regard, having the naval bases there, of course, looked after. And again, it's the only Russian, Russian territory, again, adjacent to America through Alaska. So this, this man, Rustam, interestingly enough, he... He did, he did have several failures in Ukraine, I guess even recently. So this idea that he's moved from the front battle lines all the way east, away into Siberia, is considered by many to be a certain, like, it's Putin essentially pointing out that, look, buddy, you've, um, you've, done, your, you've done your time, you've served Russia well, but these recent failures, they're kind of unacceptable. You're going to have to 
uh, go be an admin somewhere in the eastern Siberia and maybe, you know, uh, maybe help out in mobilization efforts as well as, you know, bolster our defenses over there, but don't actually participate actively in Ukraine. So we have these new appointees, right? And uh, what's interesting is most of them are, of course, have served in Syria. Actually, all of them have, but only for small durations. So short durations of about three to six months in Syria at a time. And nearly all of them have been given opportunities to serve as the general commanders of the Russian forces in Syria. And what's interesting is, notice these Russian commanders keep changing in Ukraine over and over, over the last, you know, over the last year, every three months or so, they seem to be cycling commanders. And that's exactly what Russia has been doing in Syria between 2015 and 2021. So there is that connection, like, it's almost the same Russian military doctrine. Every three or four months, the, the main commander in charge, the main general, be it a lieutenant general, a colonel general, a general of the army, uh, all these ranks are generals, by the way, it's just different rankings inside the actual general um, role. They, all these generals keep changing. Now, you may say, oh, that's a bit that's a bit nonsensical. We never saw Zhukov, of course, step down during World War II. Yet it is a new military doctrine. Whether or not it's working, whether or not it's, it's going to show any fruits, I think this Russian-Ukrainian conflict this war we're seeing now it'll kind of give us the evidence well does this military doctrine of changing military commanders does it actually bear any fruits right i guess on one hand conrad you could say that hey it's giving every general a turn to kind of lead the military one at a time and they all get battle experience so to speak because where else do you get this um opportunity to command forces on the ground right Sure, sure, but like that's kind of what Syria was for, right? This isn't Syria, and I'm thinking for for in the Syrian war it makes a lot of sense because that's a war of us backing up an ally. That's the Russians, you know. That's something that you could see how perhaps some different perspectives would be how to fight that true kind of sub or meta state war that involves multiple different factions popping up every day as the U.S. tried to maintain, you know, the slightly tried to maintain the allure of its or kind of the cover of its proxies, despite how obvious it was. Whereas now, I mean, look, let's be frank here. This is Russia extending its civilization into what it considers its territory, what it considers a place where its ethnos has been persecuted and occupied. I would I would assume that a, a kind of unified military cultural vision to use this cultural moment to also build a grander idea and myth would be something that would be valuable, not just to the operation itself, but to Russian society. So I want to hear your thoughts on that. But I also am curious, you talked about mobilizations in the East and everything. What do you think about another even larger mobilization in the next six months? Yes, yeah, so the answer to your first question, I think definitely it would benefit. I, I don't believe having this scattered idea of exactly who's leading the military, not having a face, right? Well, essentially the face is Shoigu, but Shoigu has no military history besides his of course, um, you know, Shoigu didn't serve in the military. He, he's always been, uh, he's a mil he's essentially a military lawyer, um, ex former federal agent. So he's kind of like, he's not really a military guy. So the Minister of Defense in Russia is not really a an officer. He never finished officer school. He never actually served properly in any wars. So he's always kind of commanded from the top and essentially is a bureaucrat. So, and he's not, you can't really say he's the face of the Russian military, nor is he really an attractive face. Not, not speaking aesthetically here, but maybe maybe that too needs to be taken into uh, consideration. So there isn't like this face of the Russian military that can be put forward. But yeah, cycling, I agree with you, having a more cohesive, united front for the Russians to say, even the Surovikin, right? Surovikin had this tough General Armageddon sort of feel. And he was, of course, giving press conference and speaking very, you know, to the point, very... Um, pragmatically and you know he commanded Russia so, sort of to make pretty big gains in October November especially after the fall of Izum and all these other territories in Kharkov and Donbass and, and you know the Ukrainians were pushing Russians in September so Surovikin being appointed was like a big deal and now he's kind of been moved to like this deputy status and so now he's kind of second or third in command he's kind of moved to the to the back end and so we do have these big figures coming up and Gerasimov is not very um not very appealing either so yeah, I completely agree. It would be nice to have a united um, sort of military image because we do have a powerful political image with people like Putin, Kadyrov, Medvedev. Now, Prigozhin doesn't necessarily cut it because he's only, say, he has more of a celebrity kind of like a niche appeal, right? Uh, we do need, I think, generals who are actually appealing to the Russian people um, who can, of course, uh, promote this idea that, hey, the Russian military is here. I'm its personification. I'm going to lead Russia to victory. You know, I love President Putin, I'm working with him. It's like something like that, even as propagandist as that may sound, that would be appealing. And for your second question, yes, exactly. So notice Russia has five military districts. Four of them have received new commanders. The fifth district 
is a new district which was only established in 21, so a year before the war, and it's the Arctic Northern District. It's the smallest district, or you can say it's probably smallest or second smallest, and it's essentially, it used to not be a district because it was basically, the entire area was a prerogative, uh, an administrative prerogative of the Russian Arctic Navy, the Northern, Northern Sea Navy, and so the Navy would kind of control that area, but now the Russia has established the more military presence in the in the arctic it has established its independent region and its commander is not very well known in fact i don't even think it actually does have a particular commander in that area so the four districts the western the southern the central and the eastern receiving new commanders is interesting because hey when when a second possible wave of mobilization occurs and i agree with strilkov i think a second mobilization in russia does if if we're not going to if russia is not going to vow and sue for peace with ukraine if that's not a possibility, a second wave of mobilization needs to take place because, again, Ukraine is a giant land. In order to sustain law and order here, especially if you're going to push areas such as Kherson, Zaporozhye, even, God willing, Kharkov as well, which is, you know, traditionally a Russian city. When all these places fall under Russian, I suppose, um, under Russian leadership, you do need to understand that they need to be controlled properly, proper defense lines need to be set up, and, of course, a lot of Ukrainian um, banditry needs to be taken care of. So yes, a second wave of mobilization, 200, 100, maybe even 300,000 does need to occur. And these mobilizations, they begin, the people in charge of them are from these particular districts. So if you live in the Southern District, you have to, the Southern District commander will be in charge of mobilizing his particular population, etc. So the Central is in charge of Central Siberia, Eastern of the Eastern areas. And so having new commanders, maybe it is kind of like a preparation. Okay, these new guys are in charge. They're going to be in charge of the new mobilization efforts from these districts. It, it, very big possibility. Also, again, well, this this massive shakeup in Russian military leadership is occurring literally on the precipice of spring. Of course, when we've all predicted that hey, Russia may actually begin its wave to push, which we've all been waiting for, and it is the anniversary of the SMO in about five to six days. So there's that consideration too. So I think, in my understanding, yes, it is possible a second mobilization wave is needed. Not sure if the Russian military leadership will be keen enough to go for it, but if it, if Russia does escalate the conflict, a mobilization needs to happen again. And this time, of course, everybody needs to be qualified, no new conscripts, you know, use up the reserves, which you do have. There are people very, you know, people actually want to go and, of course, support Russia if there are ends which need to be met. Yeah, I think in many ways, I mean, you talked about Strelkov, which makes me go back to the first point we want, that united kind of leader of the whole military who can kind of personify the victory. The problem is, and we talked about this a bit, I want to hear your thoughts on it. Like, does does the Kremlin see that just at all, even if they control it tightly still as a perhaps a threat to what they have considered a not fully secure successor to Putin? Like, they don't want the train to get carried away to where the success, his successor kind of gets decided without their explicit modeling through the kind of erratic nature of this military operation that's gone on for what looks like going to be over a year now. Yeah, I think there's there are certain fears, maybe not from Putin personally, but definitely those in his party, United Russia Party, which, notice, they don't have a proper opposition from any um, political parties. For example, KPRF, um, uh, I was about to say LGBT, but I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> the... A liberal democratic party that Zhirinovsky led, um, whatever the British, uh, LDPR, <laughs> not LGBT, but um, so these major oppositionary parties don't really have what it takes to, of course, overturn United Russia. But the one thing that can overturn United Russia and its leadership, and I'm not talking about Navalny and the liberals, which are pretty much done for at this point, and they've discredited themselves by supporting anti-Christian movements abroad in Belarus and Ukraine, but the the military side so a certain guys julius caesar arising in the ranks a certain napoleon fighting for the french republic and then returning home triumphantly you know a figure like a kutuzov like a zhukov and notice zhukov was of course moved to the sidelines by the khrushchev government so a powerful military figure which potentially the russian administration the bureaucrats especially are very afraid of i think that's definitely a symptom of what's happening in russia at the moment notice um, you know, we didn't, they didn't want a Marcus Crassus oligarch like uh, Evgeny Prigozhin or a Gaius Julius Caesar Surovikin type figure to arise. And I think one obvious uh, example of that, Conrad, would be, of course, the Syrian campaign we've spoken about. So the Russian Syrian um, operation, the forces in Syria were led by over between 2015 and 2021. There were 16 commanders in charge of the Russian forces there. And then we're talking about the top guys. So the CEO, the main general in charge of all the Russians in Syria, supporting Assad, fighting against ISIS. There were 16 of them in six years, you can say. 
So what is the purpose of cycling these commanders out? Of course, we spoke about the first potential purpose, which is, well, provide training to the generals on the ground. How do you command forces? How do you administer exactly, um, you know, reinforcements, ammunition, uh, all of these logistical things, which of course you can do in training exercises, but how do you actually, you know, actually conduct these on the ground during a, a live war? Yeah, it's like, yes, that experience has been attained, but also it prevented us from actually putting a put putting a face onto the whole Syrian Russian war. There is no hero of the war. Like there are heroes like we noticed the Colonel General Rustam Muradov, right? He was given the a gold medal and assigned the title of hero of Russia by Putin. But we don't hear about him why? Because he was only he wasn't even a main commander in Syria. He was simply an advisor. So and people like Kuzovlov and Surovikin only spent like six to eight months at most commanding the forces in Syria. None of them were given an opportunity to come out because perhaps there are these fears that Hey, let's not allow a, a Marcus Crassus type and the Napoleonic type, a a certain um, you know Julius Caesar type general in this Roman Republic of ours, which Russia, you know, it, it is a liberal, uh, you know, it, it's it calls itself a democratic federation. So, in this federal, in this federation, let's not allow a powerful military sort of despot to arise out of the out of the common ranks of generals to sort of take over maybe the power of the bureaucrats. I think this is just a theory, but liberals and far-right Russian circles have been pushing this for a while, which is why we haven't seen a prominent Russian military figure, even though Russia in its history is famous for its great military generals and these great figures personifying, you know, combat, Alexander Nevsky, Alexander Suvorov, Zhukov, even, you know, the World War II generals, um, anybody, even, you know, you know, you have these, uh, Prince Pyotr Bagration, and you have all these great figures throughout Russian history which personified Russia in its uh, sort of military aspect. And now we don't have any of those figures. Why? And for the most part, it's this new military doctrine of, hey, let's just uh, never, let's never let the military relax. Let's never set anything in stone. Let's keep things moving, keep things dynamic. And yeah, I, I don't know, man. I, I'm not sure whether results, uh, you know, what kind of results this will bring. But yeah, it, I think there is a potential fear in the bureaucracy. Maybe not Putin personally, but uh, again, there is a fear that, hey, the only thing that can really destabilize Russia from the inside would be a powerful military figure. Look, some people might think that that's what Russia needs, that they need someone that's more hardcore, more extreme, willing to go to total war against the West. But look, let's say that does go down. You're completely banking on that person being so convicted in their soul that they wouldn't take the most extensive attempts at bribes and threats from the West. I mean, that even if they rise with good intentions, the ease and the power with which the West can utilize to to, to exploit them and to turn them into an agent of revolution that will ultimately just lead to the rape and balkanization of Russia, that, that just can't be understated. And but that being said, when it comes to the, uh, the kind of lack of that military figure to rise up, you know, that could also be part of the reason, you know, that, that perhaps threat that those in united Russia, some might feel, could be part of the reason for us, we talked about kind of the, you know, the, the Central Asian Turco-Judeo occupation of the top military ranks in some degree but again we're going to we can get that into a into a later episode but i think that you know it's an interesting it's an interesting idea to talk about especially you know with the with how generally speaking russia compared to the u.s is has a, a more united ethnos than even the u.s which is we are no we know is experiencing extreme issues in its military in many ways due to its extreme diversity yeah, and of course, um, you know, we did mention Prigozhin and how he's kind of like a, a side figure. He's not really a general. He's just the he's just the rich guy, like a Mar Marcus Crassus type oligarch who is running his own show. And Wagner, of course, these recent movements and recent administrative sh administration changes have brought on uh, a really common issue. This week, there's been a lot of reports from the actual battlefront of Bakhmut, as well as some of the other areas. Um, for example, near Ugladar, some of these areas which Wagner is involved in have reported ammunition issues. So their artillery has not been um, has not been taken care of. They've not re been receiving any sort of, you know, ammunition supplies from the official Russian military, which is very interesting. I'm not sure why, why that's taking place. But one of the reasons, maybe because, hey, in the background, the Russian administration is churning and it is changing, you know, changing people. This may just be an oversight. Allegedly, the ammunition crisis has been resolved, and Wagner is very happy. But it led, you know, it led to say Prigozhin giving, of course, personal messages and Wagner reinforcements of publishing videos on Telegram as well as you know Twitter and other places, actually saying complaining that hey, the Russian Ministry of Defense is sabotaging our efforts in the siege of Bakhmut, which by the way is still ongoing. It's month number three now. Bakhmut has still not fallen to you to Russia or Ukraine. You know, it's kind of. Uh, it's kind of the battlefront right now in Ukraine. So nothing really has changed on that end, I'd say.
Yeah, no, as far as before we move perhaps away from actually the borders within Ukraine itself, we've seen some interesting footage of ISIS patches on what seem to be operators or at least higher ranking field officer, field operators, not just random 18 year olds wearing ISIS patches, like someone who clearly is, you know, a bit of experience, whatnot. I've got my theories on it, which I think involve Syria and some other things, but I'm curious as to yours, Dimitri. Yeah, it's very bizarre that um, the, the photos came out and, you know, of course the Ukrainian trolls would have said, hey, these are obviously fake, how could this how could this be real? But no, there are you know, photos of Ukrainian officers, not just general soldiers, wearing ISIS badges, badges with ISIS symbols on them and things of that nature from the the literal Islamic uh, you know, military state to the caliphate in the Middle East. And, you know, you may think, this is absurd, like are we going from swastikas to ISIS badges? And yes, and yeah... We've done the research, and yeah, there are actual ISIS fighters, former ISIS personnel in Ukraine, which may be spreading these badges and actually spreading this ISIS caliphate ideology amongst the Ukrainian neo-Nazis, and maybe they have something in common, I'm not too sure. And so one of them, of course, is Rustam Ajiev, which is the leader of the Ichkarian Armed Forces, which is a an ISIS orientated I would say he's a former ISIS member himself, frankly. He's actually uh, led... led uh, uh, extremist extremist ISIS forces in in Syria and participated actively alongside ISIS. So this guy is an ISIS veteran. He's actually moved to Ukraine and now Rustam Ajiev is actually fighting in Bakhmut, according to sources. So he's actually on the front lines, ready to um, you know apparently like martyr himself for this demonic cause of you know this false ISIS ideology. It's really disgusting. And he he's leading Ichgarian armed forces. Which if for those of you who don't know which Ichgari is, remember we spoke about the Colonel General Kuzovlyov, and uh, Kuzovlyov fought in the first and second Chechen campaign. So the Chechen campaigns were the Russian Federation was fighting against the self-proclaimed Ichkarian Republic, which was this new uh, self-proclaimed separatist government which appeared in the Caucasus on the territory of mainly Chechnya, but also Dagestan. And these Ichkarian separatists were very radical Muslims, and they were a very new type of Muslim following some Wahhabist as well as Salafi doctrines from Saudi Arabia, which appeared only in the 20th century. So this is not like some old traditional Muslim theology. This is something very new and something very devastating. This is not what Kadira follows today. These Ichgarians were very radical. You know, they gave us some Orthodox Christian saints. They were martyring actually Orthodox Christians in Chechnya. So the Chechnya campaigns, you know, some people call them the Chechen conflicts or the Chechen wars, um, the people, the actual criminals who survived and who, you know, because once Russia took care of that and re-established Chechnya as as a sort of independent, autonomous area and a republic and Dagestan, um, you know, the, those who escaped actually escaped where? To the Middle East. And some of them have reappeared in these Ichgarian legions. So we're talking about radical, um, I guess these radical um, Wahhabist, Salafist fighters now fighting on the side of Ukraine alongside ISIS fighters and neo-Nazis. And this isn't this is all on paper. This is all proven with facts. You can go search it up. You can search my tweets, World War Now. This is all out in the open now. So it's just a matter of a kind of coming to terms of, hey, maybe the Ukrainian regime isn't actually the one we should be following because, hey, look at the people who support it. Look at the people fighting officially in their military. This, this, is, this is quite disgusting, I mean, from any perspective. Well, I think it's just really funny. This just reminds me of how... Like, like you look at the list that Wikipedia has these lists and others, you know, about the enemies and the allies of groups like Wagner and in the general scheme of things, when this war is all said and done, you know, maybe at, at the end of it all, it'll say Russia, Belarus, PMC Wagner versus, you know, a rainbow of, of, of groups. But I just want to read some for some people, you know, I just think it's so funny, you know, they spend so much hyping up Wagner as an international terrorist group, international neo-Nazi mercenary group, whatever it is that they call them. And then you go to their, <laughs> the list that's their opponents on, um, on Wikipedia, and the opponents are Islamic State, Al-Nusra Front, Ansar al-Sunna, Nusrat al-Islam, which are all extremist Islamic terror groups that have like extremely high body counts, followed by Armed Forces of Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> Coalition of Patriots for Change, which is an African like child militia <laughs> in the Central African Republic. It's like, oh man, these these evil people fighting against fighting against, you know, the forces of good apparently here on the on this list. And, you know, of course in the long in the grand scheme of things it'll be, you know, Russia, Belarus, PMC Wagner versus Ukraine, ISIS. Blackwater, NATO, I mean, who knows what else? I mean, there's all sorts of neo-Nazis as <laughs> pagans.
it, it's just the funniest little grab bag of the willing and the willing foot soldiers of the global elite, <laughs> whoever they can throw, which, you know, those people don't know what they're, they don't really know what they're getting into when they head over there. But with all that being said, unfortunately, there is more, you know, persecution going on and stuff when it comes to, you know, these unsavory characters in Ukraine. The uh, Pochai of Lavra, which is the second largest monastery in Ukraine after the Kiev Caves, which is, you know, the known spiritual center and one of the earliest, most holy places in all of holy Russia. Uh, we know the Pochai of Lavra, the second biggest, is being threatened by the Ukrainian government right now. And of course, the schismatics are the main perpetrators and initiators of this. Dmitry, what is going on? Yeah, essentially, so the U Ukrainian government has actually set up a commission to investigate the Pachai of Lavra. And of course, the Pachai of Lavra has already been searched by the Ukrainian federal agents. So they've actually found pro-Russian material, which which means literally Orthodox Christian texts, which see, you know, prayers for Russia and things like this, which go back, of course, all the way to the Russian Tsardom. And, you know, they, they, these are texts which have nothing to do with the Russian Federation, let alone, you know, united russia or putin or any of these evil figures which you know they're so-called evil by the ukrainian government so historical texts are being brought up as russian extremist a russian separatist texts by this commission and now this commission of course is looking in into its first session into say kicking the leaderships of the leaders of this monastery of this great lavra and a lavra in orthodox christianity is is this a title given to a large male monastery or female monastery but there aren't any female lovers around not yet but pachai of lover is a large monastery essentially uh one of the largest in the world i'd say and yes it, why it's so famous is because obviously the great miracles which are associated with it the uh, enormous amounts of relics miracle working icons um pachai of lover is famous um there are even youtube videos which i don't recommend anyone watches because you shouldn't be watching videos of you know people getting exercised or you know demons but the child lover does have um these uh, exorcist uh, exorcist events um so people possessed by demons do come to the lover so that the elders can exercise demons out of them and now Pachai Lavra is having, and there's, yeah, you can see video, videos of this on YouTube, which again, I don't recommend. My spiritual father, as well as other priests, have said that, look, you shouldn't watch videos of exorcisms on YouTube and other places online because the demons, um, you know, it's something that's, uh, it's something just that's just not recommended for your spiritual well-being. Not even to, not, not just for entertainment purposes, okay? This is not a movie. These are real people affected by, um, you know, bad spiritual Ill illnesses as well as uh, demonic possession. So these things shouldn't be watched. But nevertheless, the videos are out there, and Pachai Lavra is famous for that. Now, Pachai Lavra was established, as Conrad said, it was it's the second largest monastery historically. It was established after the Kiev Caves. Why? Because in uh, 1240, when the Tatar Mongols attacked Russia, uh, Kiev was besieged, and so the monks uh, tried to evacuate the Kiev Cave Monastery and save a lot of the relics and icons. So they went north into the small community and founded the Pachai of Lavra. So it was founded 200 years after Kiev Caves, and it was essentially this uh, stronghold of monastics who survived, and also those who managed to escape and evacuate the besieged Kiev, which was completely burnt to the ground by the Tatar Mongols in 1240. So essentially it's a bit younger. It's also slightly smaller, but it also has a very rich history. Look, in in 2024 it's gonna i mean it's going to have a it's 800 year anniversary soon so it's quite an old monastery but nevertheless the ukrainian government is commissioning to kick the russian monastic as well as clergy the the bishop there kick them out of the monastery and take control of it now three things that may happen once the if the ukrainian commission of course passes this new this new legislation this new executive action they may one either kick the russian or russian orthodox clergy out of the monastery and just leave the monastery closed or two they may of course begin desecrating it like they have in kiev and begin you know uh chimping out so to speak begin uh s setting up uh, casinos discos parties you know all the raves that we've seen even the opera plays in the altars on the actual ambons and you know inside the actual ancient churches of kiev which is a desecration of orthodox rel of you know uh, it's it's a great act of sacrilege, right? For which you know the death penalty was issued back in the medieval times if you would commit to commit sacrilege of this type in an Orthodox country. Just a just a heads up: capital punishment was issued for these sort of crimes back in the day. If you were to, of course, dress up as a clown character and dance around in the church, like the the government would not tolerate this in Byzantium or Russia. Now, 
that's that, that's happening in Kiev now. They want to set the same thing up in Bichaya potentially. And of course, the third option, what they may do is not just desecrate it, but also hand it over to the schismatic leadership, which I think, Conrad, you would agree would probably be the likely... Because Bichaya is located even more west of Kiev. So essentially, it's in a more Ukrainianized territory. It's actually up north. It's in the northwest region of of Ukraine. So it's a bit close to Belarus, but at the same time, also closer to Poland. So I think there's a chance they may actually just hand it over to the schismatics, which again, would be a disaster. Well, you know, eventually they'll want the schismatics to be the only ones in the Kiev caves, maybe Pochayev's number two, maybe they'll just give that one to the Uniates, you know, get their support, you know, fully secure that vector of subversion. We've seen the Uniates wanting to take over other monasteries that with claims from like periods of history where they had it for like a decade due to some horrible military disaster and now they want to use that claim to get it now it just shows you that like look i respect if there's any byzantine catholics or anything in the audience that are on the right side of this thing but when it comes to these sorts of things there's entire wings of mil of, of religious groups that are co-opted as as hybrid warfare and as as ways to subvert the unity of of an orthodox group and that's what that's what something like that is is capable of doing and that's and that's still to this day that sounds old world but the old world is coming back and you know some of that's good but a lot of that isn't good a lot of that's ugly and brutal but that's how the world is and we've kind of been insulated from that at least in the west as our empire has done those things outwards and, and now it's coming home to roost and we're experiencing you know, that the Christians that have maintained their belief in the empire are now going to be on the receiving end of some of that. But before we go to Iran and Israel, some stuff's happening there. Dimitri has a bit of a brief, I think, on the brief meeting between Lukashenko and Putin, which some are finding a bit underwhelming. But at the same time, there are reports of, you know, Wagner groups, you know, being seen on the border of Belarus, you know, certain things being increasing there and uh, other other rumors and whatnot, but I think we're on the same page as far as we don't think that's, we don't think Belarus is throwing its hat into this officially in the next wave, let's put it that way. Yeah, from the rhetoric we heard from, uh, of course, uh, Luk Lukashenko, the president of Belarus, is that, well, he arrived in Russia about 15 hours ago and met up with Putin, and they had about a 15 to 20 minute um, sit down, essentially, Kind of just a briefing on, um, you know, what took place, uh, what's what what's taking place between the military equipment deals between Russia and Belarus, and I'll just give you a kind of a rundown what was said. Of course, a lot of people expected, you know, maybe a big press conference, perhaps Putin and Belarus and Russia, uh, you know, Putin with Russia and Lukashenko, Belarus will finally unite and the two countries will become one, and historical Russia will be united. But no, none of this took place. It was just a talk about contracts and about how management was going. So. The quick rundown is, of course, uh, Belarus fulfilled all agreements with Russia in the, the in the field of defense and security. So Lukashenko said, hey, we're actually bringing our end of the deal. We're doing great. And but Lukashenko actually announced, he said, the t trade turnover between Russia and Belarus in, 20, in 2022 is unprecedented. It was $50 billion, which, frankly, that's quite a lot for a small country like Belarus to have, you know, imports and outputs. Now, Belarus has got a lot of sanctions, so it's not like it can trade with a lot of European countries. But still, for Russia and Belarus, um, in order to deal with in, in business assets amongst one another, this is quite good. And again, uh, the, I think the most important thing was Lukashenko mentioned that Belarus is ready to enter into the production of the MiG-25 planes um, with some slight support from the Russian Federation. So Belarus will be, pro um, of course, uh, pro producing its own uh, its own bat battle jets and you know actual military air, air force equipment uh, for itself as well as russia and the kind of it's a joint russian belarusian effort in order to i guess bolster the air force of both of the countries and lukashenko kind of was very keen upon that now one thing i didn't hear from lukashenko in this and even from his voice is that he wasn't interested at all in the special military operation in fact the word war smo None of these things were mentioned. It didn't even sound like he was being overly verbose or patriotic or very, um, he, it wasn't very hyperbolic. It was a very chill contract like discussion, like just you'd, as you'd hear a conversation between businessmen. So, and of course, the whole conversation ended with uh, Lukashenko saying, and Putin, of course, nodding his head and saying, Yeah, I completely agree. They, they just said that 28 union, uh, union programs of the Russian Federation in Belarus have all been completed. So there was 28 particular projects between Russia and Belarus, 80% of them have been completed, which, you know, I guess that's a good thing. But overall, of course, everyone was looking forward to maybe larger news, but and like a union between Russia and Belarus, but maybe that's on the cards in the future. But again, a little bit of a downturn, this great meeting between these two, these two leaders of the Eastern European world didn't really eventuate and didn't really 
it was just the kind of a briefing on what's been happening and kind of the results. Yeah, and before uh, before we move away, just on on Lukashenko and everything. Remember, I mean, people say Belarus; it's not relevant. It's just this random country of ten million people. But when it comes to you know heartland theory and the idea of ruling Russia to rule the world continent, I mean, when it comes to the Europe side, I mean, Belarus is like the true heartland of like the European side of like the Russian world in a lot of ways. When it comes to when it comes to a geographical perspective, and and in many ways, Belarus is valuable not just because of its relation to Ukraine and Poland, but because Lukashenko's, you know, kind of absolute rule in a lot of ways have allowed him to give his state certain advantages with his, you know, central planning that others haven't, you know, they're actually pioneering, you know, microelectronics and microchips, which is going to be a big issue as the whole China Taiwan thing goes on. And so in many ways, Belarus can act as this, as this emergency supply for certain things that Russia needs and Russia can, you know, aid them as they need. But again, before we, I think Dimitri has one more thing he wants to say about this before we go to Iran, Israel, some stuff going on in the more southern part of the region. Yeah, there's a curious story which took place in early February, only published quite recently, but kind of really, um, it's a very small anecdote, I suppose, of what's happening in, internally in Russia and maybe other dioceses in, um, you know, currently Russian and ex-territories in Ukraine, you know, the newly, uh, you know, even probably Belarusian diocese. So the... The particular narrative is about a Russian Orthodox priest. His name is Father John K Koval, and he's he was actually serving on the outskirts of Moscow, and he was suspended by the Russian Patriarchate for, from serving temporarily, of course, until repentance or whatnot. I'm not sure what conditions were given, but he was suspended from serving on the 3rd of February. Mm -hmm. Why? Because during a liturgy, um, essentially all the Russian all the Russian parishes were given this particular prayer they have to read after the liturgy, which was, of course, it was the it was called the prayer for Holy Rus. So, uh, uh, you know, Malit was a Svetuya Rus. And so this particular prayer was, well, it's very similar to the Treparian, um, the Treparian for the elevation of the cross, where, of course, um, in the Treparian, we mentioned, you know, the, the prayer that, uh, the, the prayer to bring victory to Orthodox forces. Like, for those of you attending Orthodox Church, like, the prayer goes like, like, like so, okay? So it says, O Lord, save thy people and bless thine inheritance. Grant victory over their enemies to Orthodox Christians and protect thy people with thy cross. So this is the short prayer. And Russians have included their own prayer for their own country um, about victory, actually, in this conflict. And this priest, by himself, went on to change the words of the prayer. And he said the following. He says, from he changed the words from grant us strength to obtain victory to grant us peace by your strength and for that he was suspended now take this as you will but this sort of independent action this uh you know kind of like oh i'm i know more than say the bishops i know more than uh say the patriarch or even the the russian analyst or the russian elders i, I i'm gonna pray for peace as opposed to praying for victory for my country which is that's what's needed right now okay uh and he, for that he was suspended so um, take that as you will. That story is, of course, out. You can probably search for it. Um, that is just kind of what occurred. I'm not going to comment on it anymore. I think the suspension was completely valid, but of course, I'm not a bishop, so I'm not really in charge of the matter. But that is to take 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 that into account. There are priests as well as bishops in Russia. Certain, not I, w I actually wouldn't say bishops, but there are certain priests who have more liberal ideas of the about how the SMO should be conducted and about what Russia should be doing, and. And of course, they're actually willing to go out of their out of their way to actually change prayers and to edit them. Now, this is not something new. We've seen liberal bishops and priests throughout Russian history, of course, act, so to speak, out of pocket, and they have been punished for that. So, well, this disciplinary action hopefully will bring some sense to them. Now, Conrad, I think we can move away from the Russia-Ukraine angle for today and kind of speak about more pressing matters in the Middle East, which, of course, have been... Uh, escalating quite quite recently and you know, there's always really high tension news going on there well of course there's big things with some comments made by you know erdogan allies and turkish foreign minister about the u.s but also there was it seems to me i believe this happened a few days ago or last week but it was just leaked the jerusalem post and other places have published it that iran attacked a ship owned by a israeli businessman al ofer who i think he owns what's called the zodiac shipping group but then you look into the details of the ship it apparently it supposedly flies the Liberian flag, despite being owned by an entirely Israeli company, but then actually had been transferred to some Greek company, despite still somehow being owned by Ofer, the Israeli shipping person. So perhaps part of this is illicit shipping in action, and that's why Iran felt it necessary to attack it. You know, there's clearly, you know, these shipping, with Greece's status as in NATO and everything, they of course control most of the shipping. You wonder what 
you wonder where how that ties into it obviously with the mediterranean shipping lanes towards the persian gulf but i think that iran if that if, that, if this is if this was really happened they would probably have there must have been something going on that wasn't of a stated reason for what that ship was doing that it perhaps got attacked whether it was you know, reconnaissance or, or something like that or containing stolen resources of some kind we don't know exactly but it seems that again on all fronts as the russia thing as as it becomes clear is that we mentioned this in a twitter space you know blinken has said that crimea is like a red line for putin some of these rah rah things from ukraine aren't going to be going so well mark milley seems in many ways to not be confident in the ukrainian prospects for victory because of that iran and china are now getting heated up again in the public consciousness for for the war drums you know with all the balloon stuff with china heating up and it's calling for war and them violating our airspace and everything else and again i can see the train derailments and infrastructure stuff coming into that too and with iran you know iranian cyber attacks have been blamed before and now apparently iran is attacking more ships in the israeli uh, persian gulf and that's it seems that perhaps israel saw it as beneficial to put this information out there but i think in general that's it's it's a region that is going to be i mean who knows if we if we go to war with Iran while the proxy war in Ukraine is going on, like I just don't see how, on a short enough timeline, these don't all just blend together into the same conflict. Absolutely, and I think the um, you know demonization of China at the same time and of Iran by Israel as well as you know the U.S. has been demonizing Iran for a very long time now, but uh, it kind of comes hand in hand with even you know certain events of China and Iran actually becoming friends and allies for example recently like you could you could even see the pre iranian iranian president abraham raisi actually visits uh visits china on, on february the 15th and actually xi jinping meets him not not even as just the sort of delegate or an ambassador but meets him as an equal and leads him personally shakes his hand leads him into his personal office and they speak you know face to face you know through the use of translating tools so we have the iranian president being actually heralded as this you know great leader of a great country not just as a certain you know small middle eastern state no the chinese actually understand that iran is the key to the middle east you know we've spoken about the chinese ties on one of the twitter spaces with pakistan and of course aiding pakistan and in its infrastructure and but pakistan is small fry in terms of in terms of geopolitics compared to a country like iran even though pakistan does have nuclear missiles iran is the real key to the middle east and it's of course china's way of actually contesting larger u.s backed nations such as saudi arabia all of the hijaz hijaz areas and um you know that entire arabian bloc as well as contesting other nations such as turkey of course china and turkey have certain relations but china and iran seem to have even closer ties and now this meeting between the iranian president and chinese uh xi jinping like this is something that the west i think fears which is why we have these stories such as the balloon and other super superficial as well as um almost psyop these ideas uh being thrown out into the public that hey china is actually the real bad guy and it's even worse than russia or it's maybe on the same stance i don't think anybody anything is worse than russia at the moment according to mainstream media but china is definitely a close second well i think as the special military operation has gone on well not i think it's just it's just been happening chinese and russian investment in iran has only rapidly increased and if there's one thing we know ultimately when russia really decides if they're going to go all in with iran or if they're going to abandon them and keep their loose relationship with israel i mean that's going to be a big turning point when it comes to the global nature of the current conflict as well because it seems pretty obvious to me that israel is go going more and more mask off with their explicit support for ukraine which we all knew was happening from the beginning but when it does, when it comes to the muslim world and these other countries i want to this is very interesting we just had david on of course last week talking about the earthquake and everything in turkey and um some of the uh, some of the members of the national the vatan the neo-nationalist party that he talked about they're the other party that are the main allies of erdogan when a u.s warship was you know kind of in the area and going to come to port they were saying those who side with the U.S. become the destructive forces of the earthquake. They're claiming all sorts of things about apparently the U.S. ship coming to plan like a future invasion. He says, in fact, in the confrontation that took place in Turkey, there are forces with the USA on one side versus others. By the way, the earthquake is under the command of the U.S. as well. This is one of Erdogan's top top allies within, you know, the Turkish government, and like he's part of the ruling coalition. And, you know, this trickled up to the foreign minister himself, Mevlut Kavusoglu. I'm sorry if I said that wrong. But he said, we can decide who enters Turkey's territorial waters. There's no such request. 
Uh, even if such a request comes from the U.S., we will not allow it. There is no need for it. Why do we need a U.S. warship? There is no need for a U.S. warship to enter our territorial waters. So I don't know what Erdogan himself is, is, is putting out there exactly on for the messaging to the Turkish people, but it seems that the, the, they're doubling down on the anti-U.S. stance, hoping that that will maybe earn them the support of the actual people in Turkey, who, again, have no interest in being a U.S. vassal. But... I don't see that doing anything but earn you the full wrath of of the U.S. machine, and it seems that they'll probably just be tripling down on their support for getting the Liberal Democratic Party and their uh, their people in this next election in June. Yeah, I think potentially the only hope Erdogan really has at this point, I completely agree with David, if at the first, it, when the earthquake occurred, I thought, hey, maybe Erdogan's reaction and his actual, how he resolves this particular crisis will be... Um, Kind of a positive point for him. Well, it shows that he's a strong leader and he can he can help the country overcome this uh, this great disaster, right? Which took away so many lives, kind of unprecedented in recent decades. And but no, in fact, uh, it seems Erdogan has been really negatively hit. And even, of course, you know, not just Russian um, pro-Israeli, pro-Armenian uh, media has been really pointing it out that hey, Erdogan's uh, building constructions they're kind of the fault of the of the fact that so many. Uh, Erdogan's massive building plans that his uh, his government undertook is the you know is the is the reason why so many of these uh, so many of these buildings like they're, they're just faulty essentially badly constructed there was no oversight there was no audits into exactly how these apartments were being built it led to so many um, of the fatalities we saw a couple of weeks ago um, the other thing was of course that. Erdogan, uh, it seems like he's not, he was, he didn't appear even at the sites in the first couple of days. It took him like almost a week to actually get to the particular um, sites to actually show his support in person. Again, not a very good showing. And we're kind of rehashing on the previous stream of David. But last thing I wanted to say was, I did hear some Russian political analysts mention that perhaps Erdogan will delay the election because he did announce a three month emergency, um, emergency sort of state for Turkey. Now, of course, you know, kind of regardless of the international relations issues going on with Russia and Ukraine and Turkey being the mediator between the two. But um, if Turkey does move to the delay the election, that's probably the only the only kind of safe haven Erdogan has away from being, you know, actually thrown out of office at this point, don't you think? If it's if the election is, say, delayed by six months by, say, the courts decide so or whoever the highest authority is in Turkey. But I'm not sure what that possibility is. The Russians are saying it's a potential possibility, you know, for Erdogan to save himself. I mean, that, that that could be something that he tries to do. But then if that happens, then you even raise the higher possibility of even more extensive U.S. intervention, like full on color revolution. Right. Like that's a, that's an easy, obvious prompt for protests in the U.S. You know, they know that playbook well. Who knows what color it'll be? They'll come up with whichever one psychologically touches the hearts and minds of the average Turk the most because they're experts of, you know, the whole media psyop MK Ultra. Mm -hmm transmission game but i think it's it's an interesting idea i mean again we're going to be covering that we're probably going to do some live streams around that time if not the night of the actual election when we can kind of see the results because we believe that's extremely consequential you know one of the most consequential elections of our time possibly but with all of that being said unless dimitri has anything he wants to let us know about I want to be sure when it comes to the UFO things, what we talked at the beginning, be sure if you haven't watched my episode, the first episode of Anthony of Westgate's reversion podcast, my episode Space is Fake. I think it's really relevant to the kind of the stuff going on there. And his most recent episode, I believe it's his third episode himself, he has one all about UFOs and everything. So I encourage you to listen to that. But Dimitri, do you have anything you want to leave everybody with? Yeah, just that I'll be releasing my um, second chapter on the uh, orthodox stance on, say, military, uh, on the military and warfare. It'll be coming out this week, so stay tuned for that. And of course, we will most likely have a Twitter space. Again, it's at an uncomfortable time for Americans, perhaps a bit late in the night, but if you do have time to join and, you know, have some Q&A or just have some discussion about geopolitics and some of the subjects coming up this week in the news, feel free to join our Twitter space. So just follow World War Now underscore um, on Twitter, as well as O Canonist and Gnomerad. And yes, stay tuned for that. Yeah, no, I mean, it's not too late. I mean, 930 Eastern time, all you people, you should, most people, especially if you're not on the East Coast, should be able to make it. We have some good stuff we want to hear from our audience. And this week, we'll probably also be having possibly our first premium, maybe in the next two weeks, our first premium episode about maybe some more spicy topics. The Substack premium will be coming, the paid will be coming out. I'll set up the Stripe account this week getting a new laptop as well. So some big things are coming in the works. 
But with all that being said, thank you so much for listening. Uh, again, be sure to pray for the situation in Ukraine. Pray for unity in the church. Uh, maybe I'll write a piece about this. We forgot to talk about the Macedonian church, but maybe I'll uh, I'll write something up about that this week for the Substack. That's all really interesting stuff regarding the schism in Ukraine and what it means for world orthodoxy. But again, follow us on Twitter, World War Now underscore. Follow us on Telegram, World War Now T E L E. Uh, subscribe to us on Substack. The biggest thing you can do, worldwarnow.substack.com. That's our home base, articles, podcasts, premium podcasts, discussion threads. I have one of those going already, so go and check that out. Tell me your thoughts. Tell me what you want to see. And YouTube, obviously subscribe to our YouTube channel. Like, it really helps us out there. Share the videos, comment. We like to talk to you all in the comment section as well. But uh, yeah, follow Dimitri already said all of our Twitters. Follow us there. Uh, be sure to go to our last video in those descriptions. We have support for people in Syria and Turkey. Check all of those out. And yeah, with all that being said, thank you so much for listening. Uh, we'll see you next time as things go on. Stay tuned on all of this. There's so much dynamic stuff going on. So we hope to see you on our other places as well. But with all that being said, God bless. And thank you for listening. Thanks for listening. God bless.